if you uh, if you'd like to, you can go ahead and put out a bulletin that we still have a church here. It's okay to come on Wednesday nights. I noticed the last couple of weeks, it's like everybody's like, "Oh, nobody's there. We're not coming." <laughs> so we've been down a bit. I know it's kind of that doldrums time of the year that summertime's coming, and a lot of people are traveling. Man, a lot of people are traveling right now. It seems like everybody I know is crisscrossing the same places. I have somebody yesterday. Somebody was saying. You know, I got my flight to Denver canceled. Someone else, I flew to Denver, and so I'm coming from Denver. Like Denver is where where everybody's going. Yesterday, and and uh, just different people flying and going different places. And I know that that's just it's just that time of the year. But put the word out, and let people know that there's still a church here. In case they wondered if we're still holding service, they can come. <laughs> Chapter 10, verse 26. Amen. For if we sin willfully, after that we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law will die without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days. So Father, I pray that this evening you would help us to, as these believers are encouraged to, to remember the former days, the enlightening, the illumination, the uh, identification that we have had as believers and that we've had both with uh, you and with other of your saints who have been persecuted. God, I pray that you'd help us to identify as much uh, with the apostles and with those individuals that you used to author this letter uh, and, and to identify with you in a very real way so that, God, we would identify less with this world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, here we have the urge to identity, or the urge to identify. It's really the, the crux of the matter for these believers who are being warned in the letter. Now, keep in mind, keep in mind that this letter was delivered all at once, right? It wasn't delivered in stages or progressions. We've studied it in weekly sections, and so if you would remember that the same time that the Hebrew believers who have gone back into Judaism received their first warning. They also at the same time received you know, their, the, the second, third, and fourth, and fifth warnings as well. Remember that? Okay. So it's because it's taken us such a time to study this letter, because it, when the Holy Spirit gives something, you know, it isn't as though we had a conversation that got written down and there were a few significant things. No, it is just doctrinally packed. It's loaded. Now this would be a passage of Scripture if you like to believe that Paul penned in the letter to the Hebrews. This would be a passage where uh, you you could uh, you know you could say that Paul in verse 34 told the believers he had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. And so the, again, there's another personal note. But certainly the Hebrew Christians to whom this letter was addressed knew whom addressed it and knew as personal, but the overlying sense what got left after the letter was written was that this is more than just a letter to one church or to one group of people. This is a letter to the church, to the body, and it's inspired by the Holy Ghost, and the identification with it is more with the Holy Spirit than it is with Paul. Uh, and so that certainly is the overwhelming sense in Hebrews. I believe that if God wanted Paul to be remembered as the author of Hebrews, then it would begin with you know, the servant Paul or the Paul called to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and, or, you know, Paul, whatever. It would start off that way, but it didn't. And so it's very different than any Pauline letter, isn't it? Paul very, very specifically addressed his audience and wrote his name in the title uh, when he wrote any other letter and he left it out here. And I believe that that is, if the apostle Paul were the individual used, it was because he realized that Paul couldn't be mentioned and Christ have the preeminence. And uh, no person could be mentioned in Christ have the preeminence that he is 
given here. Also, as well, sometimes we dumb down a message or we lessen the force of a message by making it on our say-so instead of on God's say-so. Isn't it so? In other words, man, I could urge you to do things as your pastor or as your friend. And being your pastor and being your friend, I assume, has some level of force with you depending on your attitude. It has some degree of force, doesn't it? As your pastor or as your friend. But when I am really wanting to appeal to you, I'm not going to appeal to you as your friend or as your pastor. I'm going to appeal to you uh, on the basis of God and God's Word and God's authority. All yeah, right? Jesus. And that's the highest level of relationship. And so that's the tone of this letter to the Hebrews. Is We're not appealing you to you from Paul or any other of the apostles' uh, perspective. We're appealing to you from the perspective of the Lord Jesus Christ being better than religion and the Holy Spirit being the one who takes the message and makes it powerful. And if you are called to be a preacher, many, I think everyone's called to preach the gospel. Men and ladies alike are called to preach the gospel. God give us more gospel preaching believers. And I believe that many of the men in our church have a call in their life to preach the Word of God and to, in, in certain place, certain degree, maybe not necessarily pastoring, although maybe for the, in the future uh, for some of you. But being that what it is, make sure that when you preach a message that you don't preach it on your authority. You don't preach it with the, with the greatest force being, I said so or I think so, but the greatest being force of a letter being for Jesus' sake. For Jesus' sake. And so that's the way this letter is written. We're reminded that in every sense, Jesus Christ is better than religion. And truly, when we <coughs> remind ourselves of the benefits of being a believer and being a believer in the church age, Jesus, I mean, that's such an understatement that it, it, it just doesn't get it, does it, to say that Jesus Christ is better than. Hebrews says over and over, Jesus is better than. Consider Jesus. Consider Him because He's better than. And He's better than Judaism. He's better than the angels. He's better than the priest, priest system. He's better than the law of Moses. He's better, He's better, He's better, He's better. And here we have been in the middle of an argument by the Apostle Paul where he has talked about the finished work of Christ and his priesthood is better than the, the unfinished work of a priest who has to offer a sacrifice first for himself and then for the people. And then once he's offered that sacrifice, the next thing up is to offer it again because it's never a complete final sacrifice and His work is never done, and so He's always standing. In contrast with Jesus, who did not need to offer a sacrifice for Himself because He Himself had never sinned, and then He offered Himself as a sacrifice for others, and Himself was our priest going into the throne room of God and offered His own blood and with a better covenant. And He satisfied a better covenant in a new way, and after he offered the sacrifice, he sat down because there remains no more sacrifice. There's just nothing more that can be done. And that, should we say, there's nothing more that needs to be done because of how complete the sacrifice is. Think on this. Think on this. It is one thing for a sacrifice to be sufficient for a generation or for a time. But before I was ever born, the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice had already covered me. And before anyone was ever born, God's plan for the sacrifice of Himself was already completed. Meditate on that. Think on the sufficiency of the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ. That before He had been offered, it was sufficient for people to, to believe it by faith. And after... He had offered it. It was sufficient for people to receive it by faith. And we'll see specifically that in chapter 11 next week. We're introduced to the notion of the concept of faith. But this evening in our context tonight, I'd like to just look specifically at verse 26 and then get right down into a, a, couple, of, a couple of arguments. We really have two arguments and then we have a conclusion based on the argument and, and, and the arguments also have a warning in them. Now the warning passage really begins in verse 30. And so if you'll see it that way, it'll help you 
to go through the flow of thought. Now, um, there are in in the uh, Greek language there are conditional sentences. Anytime you see uh, the translation "if" in our language, of course, that is a translation translation of a conditional word "a," which is "if" you know epsilon yoda, which would be the "if" clause in the Greek language. And in in an if statement, there is a protasis and an apotasis. Okay, now protasis, apo, de, sis. Okay, so pro before, apa from. Okay, so in, in the conditional clauses, I'm not going to go through all of them, but in a conditional clause, uh, there are different ways that a clause could be used. Um, if he is 16, I'm the Pope. Okay. Now, what that's saying is, if that's true and it can't be, then this also is untrue. Right? That's that type of a, a statement. Okay? If he can make it up the hill, so can I. And that says, if this is true, then this also is true. If he can do it, I can too. With that sort of a statement. So, that type of a conditional clause. Uh, sometimes you talk about something by, uh, and you deal with it in the sense of an impossibility. If, if this is impossible, then this must also be impossible, and so forth. So four classes of conditional sentences or conditional clauses. This is a conditional clause, and I'd like to look at it very quickly. Uh, in verse four, 26, the Bible says, If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of truth, then the statement is, There remaineth no more sacrifice, for sins. Now, if you're studying conditional clauses, it's a real help for you because uh, this is a, if this is true, then this is also must be true as well. Okay. And the question then is, why is this true? If we sin willfully after afterward, after we have uh, received the knowledge of the truth. Okay. So let's. First of all, let's dial back a little bit and let's ask, when did the Hebrew believers receive the knowledge of the truth? What are the possibilities for the after we receive the knowledge of the truth? When are the possibilities for these the, the addressees to have received the knowledge of the truth? Perhaps, that, uh, perhaps when Peter preached to them. Okay, so Pentecost... Right, so we're we're assuming that most of these believers, these Hebrew Christians, uh, evidently they're at Jerusalem, and, and our context in chapter ten, which alludes to the destruction of Jerusalem in seventy A.D., certainly seems to indicate that uh, this letter to the Hebrews is a letter written to the Hebrews at Jerusalem, or to the Hebrews that continue or that return to Jerusalem for Passover every year. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we could say then. What, what could be the second possibility for receiving the knowledge of the truth? Time-wise. Oh, I was going to say they, they were, because of persecution, they pulled out of Jerusalem and then they... Right, died. many believers were already scattered at this point in time. So, so they could be other places. But, uh, but if you're going to say Peter, we're going to say the message of Jerusalem. And could we say that probably everybody had heard Peter's message by then? It was recorded. Peter's message was. Now it doesn't mean uh, it doesn't mean that Acts had been written. Luke wrote Acts, but if you think that nobody recorded Peter's less Peter's message, uh, there were probably people that could quote it word for word Holy that Spirit were there. Did. Yeah, the Holy Spirit certainly <laughs> did with Luke. Certainly used Luke to do it. But if I heard a message like that, I could probably. I'll be honest with you, I could probably put it down. Because he quoted mostly Scripture. His flow of thought went through the Scripture. So I could remember the passage of Scripture. When I remember the passage of Scripture, that would trigger the memory to remember what was said. And of course, for quite a while, Peter still would have been around. And uh, there would have been, I, I just think it would have been commonly written down. The message would have been written down. A lot of journals, a lot of diaries, a lot of records, and it certainly would have been rehearsed from ear to ear. So even if you weren't there at Pentecost, you probably heard the message. Okay, so we could say that. What would be another time that we'd be talking about sending willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth? 
Well, it's another possibility. How about upon delivery of this letter? It's a warning letter, right? And you're being warned that you could physically go back into Judaism, but it won't work. So that could be knowledge of the truth as well, right? Isn't this overwhelming message? If you go back into Judaism, it won't work and there will be consequences for it? Okay. Now, we could say both would be possibilities. Probably the first being the like most likely, right? That what we're talking about is whenever the recipients personally received Jesus and the Holy Spirit entered into them and they tasted of those of the heavenly gifts and they received the Holy Ghost and God worked in their lives. And actually the context alludes to their having participated uh, in, in identifying with Christ through their own persecution and identifying with Paul and his persecution. Okay, so now I'm not, I'm, everybody's sleeping right now. Y'all tired. And it's, that's not entirely my fault. You know, everybody's, everybody's falling asleep right now. But I, I just, I want us to get this understanding here because the, the statement, the hypothesis, the, the, then this is so. If this is so, this is also so. Well, the Bible says there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Well, why then is there no more sacrifice for sins? <clears throat> What, what have we just spent all this time explaining being the reason for which there are no more sacrifices for sins? What, Jesus isn't going back to the cross and Judaism doesn't work anymore. That's what, that's what the Scripture is saying. Judaism doesn't function anymore. It doesn't work anymore. And so you go back into Judaism with the notion that you can receive sacrifice for sins there's only one sacrifice for sins that's legitimate, and it's not happening again. Jesus isn't going to die on the cross again. He already did, and it's sufficient. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So here they're being sternly told, you're wasting your time on dead religion. You're wasting your time on dead religion. Now somewhere, believer, we need to have the same balance that the Holy Spirit gave the author of Hebrews in giving people truth and then really giving people, really confronting people with truth. Uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit really uses kind oral arguments and then the Holy Spirit uses some, if that doesn't work, then terrify you arguments at the same time. And you know, believer, for a Christian who would say, you know, I just, you know, you shouldn't preach that hellfire and damnation kind of preaching. We shouldn't preach hatefully. I don't think anyone should agree on that, right? There's a difference. But there's a certain time when you have to tell somebody, you'll go to hell. You'll go to hell if you don't receive Jesus. In other words, if you don't listen to one, you ought to listen to the other. And if you won't listen, maybe sometimes something has to happen to get your attention. And I know people who have been saved uh, as a result of some hellfire damnation preaching, and I are one of them. Uh, the guy that the Holy Spirit used to preach the gospel in the time that I got saved was a hellfire damnation, how to control gospel preacher. How to control. He used to go around with a megaphone yelling at people out of his uh, Pinto station wagon. And um, he, and you remember the Pinto station wagon with the little round, little round window, and he had one of those, you know, the curtain. He slept in the back, and and uh, my dad invited him home to stay the night at our house, and he confronted me about about uh, my not being saved. I was four years old, and I got saved, and so I have to say that that resonated with me. He said, people don't get saved when you preach the gospel, hell, fire, and damnation. Well, some do. Some do. Some people get saved when you. Uh, when you're compassionately preaching the gospel to them as well, uh, God uses both kinds. Be careful. Be careful about being judgmental, about people being judgmental, okay? Just watch it, because you might find yourself in judgment by the actual judge. If you, uh, you know, somebody may be called to do something, present something in a way. I, I know many times I thought, you know, that's not the right guy to preach the gospel to that person, and the Holy Spirit's shown me otherwise. Right? So you be the person God's called you to be. Don't be obnoxious and don't make it about you. 
But uh, you just follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. All right, now, in verse 27, the Bible says, But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. So there's no more sacrifice for sins, but I'll tell you what's coming is judgment and fiery indignation devouring the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall ye be thought shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of covenant of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. Now, there could be two individuals that would fit into this category. We could say it would be the individual that would go back into Judaism that he's despising the blood of Jesus Christ and counting the blood of the covenant that he's under. He's just doing despite to it. Or we could also say that Judaism as a whole completely fits it and accurately falls under this description. I think that the latter would be more true than the former, but to identify with something is to become one with something. And what the Holy Spirit here is saying is that Judaism is about to be about to be smashed. And you know who destroyed the temple? You want to say Titus, don't you? Go ahead and say it, and I'll tell you you're wrong. It was the soldiers, wasn't it? Well, it would have been soldiers, but it would be under Titus, who later became the emperor in 70 AD, that, that uh, went through the court of Bethesda and up around through the temple and down through the court of the Gentiles and desecrated the temple and destroyed it. And uh, the Jews were scattered and Jerusalem was destroyed at the time of the at the time of the Passover when all the Jews from all around the world would have been there. They say Josephus says that more than a million Jews were slaughtered. More than a million Jews were slaughtered during this destruction of Jerusalem by Titus. Um, the human instrument would have been Titus but don't you think that maybe maybe the person who ordered it? See, now, you remember a couple years ago when Pat Roberts said that uh, Louisiana got destroyed in the hurricane because of, because of uh, being so wicked that it was judgment? And uh, sometimes when there's a bombing, some uh, guy like John Hagee or someone will come out and say, I think John Hagee said this. I'm sorry, John Hagee, if I'm wrong about this, but I think that you got in trouble for saying something happened to the Jews a while back because of judgment. I, certainly, individuals have said that the Holocaust was a result of Israel's rebellion against God. Now, here's the deal. Um, I always side with the people that are the apple of God's eye. That's my position on it. Uh, but people who despise the covenant of the Lord and despise the Son of God, vengeance belongeth unto Him. And if you think that Titus is the instrument of vengeance in the destruction of the temple, you're mistaken. It was God. It was God. And here believers are warned that Jesus is mad and He's coming. And you know that's uh, that's not you know that the funny T-shirt. You know Jesus is coming and He's mad. And boy, is He is He mad? No, we're serious. Jesus went into Jerusalem and destroyed that dead religion, so people would know God wasn't in it. Any religion, <laughs> any religion, you know, and it's interesting, our trip to Greece and Turkey, we saw this so much that anytime there's a conquest of an idol or a god, the first thing you do is take out that person's god and set up your own. Because when you conquer a people, when you really conquer them is when you conquer their religion. And uh, Jesus destroyed, destroyed the temple because it, it was nothing but a symbol of religion. If the temple's rebuilt today, my friend, don't go there. Don't support it. Because it's nothing more than a symbol of religion. God's not there. God isn't in it. When God wants to build His temple, it'll be better than anything that anyone here can build. And so you say, Pastor, they've already got all the furniture the Temple Institute does. They have hogwash. they got a bunch of junk. Jesus will make the good stuff. You hear me? Jesus will make the good stuff. Don't support that nonsense that uh, is thumbing your nose at the Son of God and the sacrifice that He made. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. If the first is true, the second is also true. And so if you think that somehow you're validated because Judaism at one time uh, 
when it was God's way, it was valid. What we're told here is there's nothing valid about it anymore. There's nothing valid about it. This is why you as a believer should have no tolerance for uh, the whole messianic Christianity. The merging of pagan Judaism, and I said pagan Judaism, pagan Judaism with Christianity and, and making messianic worship where, okay, we're going to add Jesus to Judaism. Well, that's as valid as making Diana Mary. It's just as valid, but it's what I'm saying is it isn't valid at all. Jesus Christ established His church, and the church is what He's all about. We ought to get excited about that and realize there remains no more sacrifice for sin. I'm not angry about this, by the way. Uh, you're just so tired, you're boring me. And so it's hard to speak with very much emphasis. Could I ask a question? Yes. Verse 39, but we are not of them that draw back, but of them that, which believe to the saving of the soul. Mm -hmm. And then uh, six, 6 verse 9 says, but brethren, we are persuaded better things of yeah. you. Yeah. The picture I'm getting of this is that... Paul this is, is what's happening then, but that's not us, is it? So Paul, is writing, Paul is writing to the Hebrews. Mm -hmm. And in this group of Hebrews, some of the ones that are hearing it are those that are drawing back, and some of the ones that are hearing it are those that have remained faithful. And so he's differentiating between the two, maybe? Is that No. no? I, I think he's, he is making a very, very kind assumption that this is what's going to happen to the bad people. But we're, you're not a bad person, are you? Okay. You know, in other words, if you get caught shoplifting in Publix, and if you get caught taking chicken tenders, and going behind the counter taking chicken tenders and eating them, then the BSO is going to take you to jail, but you're not going to get caught doing that, are you? No, sir. Okay. And that's the idea. That's the tone of the letter. We're, we're, rather, we're persuaded better. Here's what happens to these dirty, rotten rascals, and here's what they deserve, and here's what Jesus is going to do. Fiery mm -hmm. judgment. Devouring of his adversaries. And Jesus, God said, vengeance is mine. I'll repay. By the way, you want a good study? Go to uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Now, this you can take notes if you'd like to. Romans chapter 1, verse 17, where Paul is talking about uh, the, the same thing, uh, or he, he uses the, the same context, Colossians chapter uh, chapter three. Let's see. I'm getting. I'm actually getting ahead of myself. That's in the uh, the just shall live by faith one. I meant to say Deuteronomy 22:35 and Romans 12:17, where Paul quotes the vengeance is mine. I will recompense, saith the Lord. But let's look at that. Let's let's focus on that. Okay. Let's let's look at the bad example. All right. Uh, this is this this will this will suffice. This will help. When I was four years old, I was convicted of a crime. Almost, uh, I stole a padlock from a piece of luggage at Kmart. Now the padlock wasn't for sale; couldn't be bought. It was on the luggage, so probably it was a free sample, as far as I knew. But I took it home, and I was found out the next day. And and uh, my brother, uh, it was probably, you know, my brother mostly did things that I talked him into doing, so it's probably my idea. Uh, most likely. I probably was the ones, but he was a co-conspirator at least. And when my parents saw that we had a padlock, which they knew we hadn't purchased anywhere, hadn't been given anywhere, but one of those little tiny piece of junk padlocks in our luggage, piece of luggage, when they saw we had that the next morning, they asked where we got it, and the confession was forthcoming eventually. And when they found out where we got it, then my mom called the police department and said, you know, I just have to confess that I'm the mother of, you know, a couple of robbers and they stole a padlock from Kmart, and the policeman said, bring them to jail. Uh, and so then before that, well, before we come to jail, I need to make sure to go back to Kmart and talk to the manager there. So my mother called the manager Kmart. So we went to, to Kmart, and by the way, I'm glad Kmart went out of business. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> we went to Kmart, the manager spoke to us, gave us a stern warning about it. We returned the padlocks. After that, we went to jail. And uh, we were given a two, I'm, we're, I'm four, my brother's barely three at this time, so we're taken to jail and given a tour, allowed to stand in the cell with the door shut. And uh, it's rather terrifying. I think we burst into tears, if I remember right, but I'm not sure. We might have been hardened criminals at that time. I'm not quite <laughs> sure how far along we were. But we robbers uh, were there, and then we were given a talking to by, I don't know if it was a policeman, the chief of police, or whatever, but the policeman spoke to us, lectured us, and basically said, here's what happens to thieves, but you're not going to be a thief, are you? 
<laughs> decided against that. That's not me. Sometimes a good talking to, a good warning about the consequences or where you end up is, is in line. You know, it's an old stay in school speech. You know, here's, here's the progression, here's what happens. The whole obey your parents speech. If you can't learn to obey, this is the kind of job you can get. This is the kind of education you can get. This is how far you'll go in life. And then you take the disobedient child to the prison and show them where people that can't obey have to be locked up because they have to be made to obey and they, they can't uh, rule over their own spirits and that sort of thing. Well, that's the kind of the idea, the tone of this. It's a very stern letter and serious. It's not joking. But what we're being told is this religion you're going back into is about to get nuked. And you don't want to be there. There is a married or a... Um, there's a sister doctrine for the church called church discipline. Why do we do church discipline in the church? Two reasons, right? Two reasons for church discipline. I was always taught purity. God, God, Christ wants a pure church because of the testimony. is important. And number two, restoration. Right? So why is it that somebody cannot be living in willful uh, public sin and be a member in good standing in the church? Why is that not allowed? What? doesn't help those goals. Yeah, it, it, it destroys the testimony of Christ. But also, what is going to happen to a believer who's living in sin? Judgment. They're going to be dealt with. And sometimes, you know, the judgment is not a... Uh, it's more of a scud missile than a uh, heat-sinking Patriot missile, you might say. In other words, if a scud hits, it's just going to blow up everything around it. I'm making jokes about the 1980s in case you can't remember. But, uh, you know, God's able to judge an individual, but if, if judgment has to come and it hits somebody in the church house, there's going to be collateral damage. You don't want to be around someone who's getting judged, right? If I hear something like, you know, uh, this person's committed a crime uh, and they're coming to my house to hole up. There's a, this whole aiding and abetting thing is not something I want to participate in. And I tell you what else I don't want to do. I don't want to come to my house when the police come to get them. You know, I don't want to hunker down in there when they're hunkering down and bullets start flying through my windows. Why? Because I can be struck. I can get hit. And here we're being warned, Judaism's in trouble. Don't be in it. Get out of there. Uh, do you remember what um, David would say before he would before he would deal with, was it, or was it Saul? It was Saul, wasn't it, that we read in Judges a few weeks ago was going to go and destroy a city. And he told the inhabitants, that was the Amalekites, wasn't it? But who was it that was, was it the Amorites that were with them? Somebody was in their city, and it was the Kenites. Told the Kenites, Pretty sure it was the Kenites. Said, "What? It was the Kenites." Says, "You know, we're about to wipe them out. You probably don't want to be there." And they left town. Oh, you know, if they're going to get wiped out, I think I'm going to leave town. And you just don't want to be there to be part of judgment. And that's the idea of Hebrews chapter six and Hebrews chapter ten. Is God's going to judge the rebellious unbeliever? Judaism is an affront to God. Any ism, any religion is an affront to God. And he is the one that says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And it's not a matter of, now don't you take vengeance. Uh, I'm going to take vengeance. No, God is saying, vengeance belongs to me, and I'm jealous over it. Uh, don't get offended by my putting it this way, but God is saying, I enjoy vengeance. Vengeance is a part of my righteousness. And I will take vengeance. Vengeance. I will repay. It's not a matter of, don't you take care of it, I'll take care of it. You know, I'll handle this. It's not, I'll handle this for you. God is saying, I'll handle this for me. It's my problem. It's mine. Don't you go taking something that belongs to me. Vengeance belongs to me. Do you understand the tone? It's different, isn't it, than the way we interpret that scripture sometimes. sometimes oh, you know, don't recompense evil for evil because vengeance belongeth unto me. Well, 
it's true that you. But what it's saying is you don't need to worry about evil because God's got it all handled. And but more than that, God is saying, "I'm taking vengeance. It belongs to me, and God's not doing it for your sake." Do you hear me this evening? In other words, God isn't going to take vengeance to avenge you. God's taking vengeance to avenge Himself. And vengeance is a lot bigger deal to me when it comes from that perspective. And I don't want to identify with God's vengeance. And again, we're warned, you go back into this rebellious Judaism that has a fake priest instead of Jesus, the once for all sacrifice, and the superior priest sworn with an oath after the order of Melchizedek. And I'm going to destroy it. I'm going, to, I'm going to destroy that religion. And so, then he says in verse 31, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Another understatement. Verse 31. Verse 32. But call to remember the former days. And now we get to the encouraging part. So the first part is a warning part. Uh, the first part of this uh, passage. Now this is a, a warning, or is an encouraged part. Encouraging part. Saying you don't think you can make it? Well, remember when you did? Remember when you did? You ever done something that you thought you couldn't do and once you'd done it, you knew you could? We did the ropes course for the teens last Saturday evening and there were a couple of teenagers that when they actually looked at the ropes course decided, I don't want to do that. That's a little too much. And uh, one in particular, I talked into doing it because I said, you know, once you do it, you'll know you can. And it'll be something that you'll just be able to be confident about after that. Once you go and try it, once you do it, you can do it. I know you can. But once you do it, you'll know you can. And here where this is that sort of an encouragement in statement. Don't you remember? Do you recall? Call remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great flight, fight of afflictions. Mm -hmm. It's too much. The affliction is too great. I can't bear it. Well, just let's just think back a minute and let's remember that you could, that you did. You've already done this. You can do it. You can make it. You have before. You know, isn't it incredible sometimes the straw that breaks the camel's back really is just a straw? What is it? It isn't the straw. It's that on top of everything else. But you know, sometimes Christians get discouraged over the silliest of things. Are you like me where little things bother you and big things don't sometimes? I'll get all bent out of shape over something that just doesn't matter and things that do matter, I just kind of take, you know, as a matter of course. Well, God's in control and He can handle it. I'll be okay. But silly things bother me. Just ridiculous things. My wife knows what they are. I don't have a good enough memory. And that bothers me a little bit. But uh, I don't have a good enough memory to know what those things are. But she can tell you if you want to ask her. She might not. But uh, she could, if she wanted to, could tell you little things that bother me, that irritate me. And it's, it, it's, it's really comical to me. I laugh at myself all the time over what I get bothered by. I just, I just think it's funny how silly things are. And this really is the perspective of, you know, you don't think you can make it, but don't you remember making it? <laughs> really? I'm not going through this again! Well, just remember that you went through it before. <clears throat> and that's actually an encouragement if you'll, if you'll be wise enough to have that perspective. I can't do this again. <clears throat> Well, when you said that, you just said you did it before. So, think on the logic of that. If you've done it before, you could do it again. Right? Listen, I don't want to... Why am I battling the same thing again? Well, because it's something you can win. You won before, you can win again. That's the argument here. It's a good one, isn't it? Uh, it, it, it just defeats the logic of the flesh of, you know, I can't do this again. Well, the fact that you did it before is an indication that you can do it again. And so go ahead and be honest about the statement. You say, I'm not willing to do this again. I'm unwilling to do this again. Let me just say to you that, that that's part of the curse, is going through a life of things that if you had a choice about it, you would, but you don't get a choice. And the sooner you, you remember that you deserve the, to, to have to go through life. You're not too good for the life that God's appointed you to live by His grace. The better off you'll be. It's good to realize, you know, this is difficult what I'm going through, but God wants me to, and so 
I can do this, and I'll do it, and I'll do it by His grace. And it's a good reminder for me that I don't get to tell God what my life's supposed to be like. Oftentimes, when individuals suffer, we pray for healing. But the fact is that if I had perfect health, I'd get tired of living eventually. You know, about the 23rd hour of every day, I feel like I'm, I've had enough living. Ever just get tired? And when you're tired, your perspective is just, yeah, I don't want to do it anymore. You get up in the morning, you feel like taking it on again, but man, you just go through those times, those periods of life. And that's reality. And what you and I need is a little bit of perspective to remember we don't get to pick our and choose our reality. The reality of is we were born sinners, destined to hell, but Jesus died on the cross for our sins and gave us the Holy Spirit, and so we can make it victorious. But the notion that we shouldn't have to suffer or undergo and endure any hardship is first illogical and second unreasonable. You don't deserve not to suffer. You don't deserve not to go through hardship. And consider as well that God is able to give you the grace for it. And not only that, but He rewards you for it. Perspective, my friend. Don't quit. And certainly don't quit over a straw. Don't quit over, I'm not doing this again when you've done it before. Well, how many Christians quit over the word again? Well, I'm not going to go through another church split. I don't know how many pastors quit over and again. If, if someone leaves the church again, if someone says that to me again, if that happens again, well, friend, you survived it before. Why don't you survive it again? What's again got to do with it? Mm -hmm. You know if you've gone through it, you can endure. And what a difference between someone who knows they can endure. Well, I've been through this before. I can make it. Versus I've been through this before. I can't make it. One's logical. The other's illogical, right? And that's the argument here, and I like it. It's a help to me. It helps me with my thinking. And then it goes on to say, partly you endured... Part of the things you endured whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions. Whereas you were, an open, you were a spectacle, you were put to shame. And partly whilst you became companions of them that so were used, for you had compassion of me and my bonds. Now here he's reminding part of the time that you went through this being a gazing stock, being persecuted, being thought ill of, being talked about, being looked at that way, part of it was because of your own persecution. But part of it was because you said, you know something, I'm going to stand with my brother. And you chose to. So while you're being reminded that you've done this before and you can do it again, you're also being reminded that it used to be you wanted to go through it. You said, if he's going through that, then I'll go through it too. <clears throat> you know, it's sort of like this whole sympathetic exercising or losing weight thing that we sometimes do. Oh, you're going to go run? Well, if you're going to torture yourself, I'll torture myself too. Kind of identify with you, encourage you. You're going to diet? Well, if you're going to torture yourself, I'll torture myself too. You know? Uh, now, I'm not making light of persecution and affliction. But Paul is being mistreated and yelled, and it could be Paul that's speaking here. But we know each of the apostles were persecuted for their faith. Every single one of them was. Uh, all of the leaders in the church were persecuted because of their faith. Every single one of them was. This is certainly a Hebrew Christian who's being persecuted, and they would have known him, they would have identified with him, and they would have stood with him in the past. And now while he's standing alone, and they're saying, it's just too much, I can't stand with you anymore, he's saying, well, you stood with me because you wanted to before. You thought it was worthwhile before. You had a desire before to go through affliction. So what is being brought to the forefront here? It's that God hasn't changed, circumstances haven't changed, but you have and it's not the right change. Remember, go back. You know, that's why uh, sometimes we'll have a talk about, tell us about when you were saved. Tell us about after you were first saved. I love to hear people's when they were first saved testimony. And then uh, the important stages of spiritual growth. Why? Because I like watching their face when they remember those victories, when they remember the sweetness of God speaking to them and the assurance that they had. And I love watching them go back to that moment by remembering it. 
and here they're being reminded you've forgotten the whole thing. You've forgotten what it's you've forgotten what it's what it's worth, and that's that's why you have a letter to Ephesus had the uh, uh, the you've left your first love. Remember, remember, remember. You weren't just a gazing stock, but you wanted to be a gazing stock because you said, I, if that's what that's about, I'll do it. If it's about being persecuted for Jesus, I'll be persecuted for Jesus because Jesus is worth it. If it's about identifying with the brethren because they're being persecuted with Jesus, I don't want to be anything but identified with the brethren. I don't want to be a sneaky, low-down, traitor dog that goes around acting like I'm not a Christian when the Christians are getting persecuted. If Christians are getting persecuted, sign me up! I'm all in. These are the people that went down and got baptized on the day of Pentecost in front of everybody. And they said, I'm in. I'm all in. Sign me up. And they're being reminded about that. They're being reminded to go back into that Judaism. And not only is it the religion that's persecuting and trotting underfoot our Savior, not only is it a despicable excuse for ungodly rebellion, but Jesus is going to destroy it. And by the way, you didn't want any part of that before anyway. Sign me up. That's the reminder here. It's a good one. And then verse 34, For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. You didn't worry about losing everything before because you knew you had everything that had been gained. And friend, it's true. We've gained everything. We can lose nothing. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. That's the conclusion. And we'll go ahead and allow that to be the conclusion this evening because next week we'll go into the faith context. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense and reward. It's not worth it to follow Jesus. Well, yes, it is. The reward, the treasure in heaven, the recompense of reward, it's worth it. And what a great path that we've been brought along the logic of. What a great logical path we've come along to realize, you go back into Judaism, there's no more sacrifice for sin. There's vengeance that is coming toward that. And by the way, that's not you. Because you remember, you remember what it was like when you were first saved. Remember when you on purpose identified with persecution, not only for yourself, but also for me, your brethren, brothers, and do you remember when you were spoiled, your substance was taken away, and it didn't matter to you because you had eternal you had eternal treasures that mattered more to you? Don't forget about that. Cast not away. Don't cast that. Don't throw it away. Don't throw it away. It's all worth it. It's all going to be worth it. If Christian, the same as that was true for them is true for you today. And I can't help but think that every single one of us either needs now or will need in the future this same encouragement. And so, absorb it. Internalize it. And don't forget it because it will help you make it having this, not only logic, but truth which is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. Thank you God for what we learned and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take some prayer requests this evening.